It's really interesting how you can see the numbers increase every second. <laughs> He's not entered at one time. Good morning, everybody. We're just, we're just waiting uh, a minute or two so everybody who wants to join can join. So thank you for your patience. Okay, I'm going to start. I'm Susan Aronson. I'm greeting you from Arlington, Virginia, headquarters of the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub today. And I hope everybody is doing well. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's seminar on data governance in smart cities, I think is really timely. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to our two speakers. Hi, by the way, I'm Susan Aronson, and this is Teresa Scassa, our first speaker. And Teresa is the Canada Research Chair in Information Law, and she's also a senior fellow at the Think Tank Center for International Governance Innovation. We also have Bianca Wiley, who is also a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation which by the way is a hotbed of thinking on technological and in particular data governance issues. And I hope you'll check out their website when you can. Um, Bianca is also an activist. And so we're going to have a good overview of how cities are using data to modernize and problems inherent in that. Teresa? Thanks very much, Susan. Um, and so I, I'd like to thank uh, Susan for, for putting this together, giving us a kind of a, um, a show of normalcy in the middle of a pandemic where we can come together and talk about something like uh, smart cities. And I also want to thank uh, Thomas Struitt, who you can't see, but who's behind the scenes and has done a lot of work in helping to uh, organize this event. Um, I uh, send you all uh, my uh, wishes for your wellness and, and safety in this uh, in this time. So I'm just going to lead this off. And I, I think the, the approach we want to take, we don't want to be like uh, talking heads for the full hour. We want to move to questions and discussion as soon as possible. Um, you should have a question button um, or, or the ability to, to ask questions or to type questions uh, as they come up or as they occur to you or when you want to ask them. Um, and Bianca and I are going to speak for a relatively short uh, amount of time to get to set the context. Um, and then um, as Susan will take over as mod moderator. Um, so if you have questions, please uh, do enter them in the, uh, uh, in the question area. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about what a smart city is. And academics love these kinds of things and, and, and can spend a lot of time on definitions. And in fact, if you look at the academic literature, there's, there's a whole discussion um, uh, about the definition of a smart city. Uh, and I'm not going to get into that because I said I'd speak briefly. So uh, basically, a smart city is one that relies on data and analytics and increasingly relies on artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in order to operate effectively and to predict, identify, uh, and resolve urban challenges. But this concept has been critiqued, um, and I think the critiques are important. Important uh, ones to think about. Um, for example, not all urban problems are suited to technological identification or solution, um, and perhaps not even the most important ones. And so I think that's an important critique and something uh, important to keep in mind. There's not everything can be solved by technology or even identified by technology. Um, technological solutions also come with a cost, and that cost may be uh, in terms, it may be a social cost, it may be a cost in terms of privacy. Uh, or human rights and uh, civil liberties. And so these are also things that um, have been critiques of smart cities and I think are important to keep in mind. Um, technological solutions can also disrupt the distinction, especially in the urban context, between private and public sector uh, actors. Uh, and this raises important issues about governance, about transparency, accountability, uh, and democracy. Um, particularly when you're talking about uh, platform-driven smart city solutions. And so, again, this is, uh, this is something I think that's quite important and we'll come back to it uh, in the broader discussion. Um, technological solutions may also not be sustainable. And so, um, you know, many people uh, prefer to talk about 
smart, sustainable cities um, to, to emphasize the fact that whatever solution is adopted has to not only be consistent with uh, broader sustainability issues, but also with sustainability of the, the solutions that are being put in place. Um, when I talk about sustainability, it could, could include um, uh, environmental costs, but it could simply include the, the costs of maintaining the technology and updating the technology um, over time. Um, and so some have modified uh, the term smart cities. There's a lot of, I think, antipathy or, or yeah, antipathy to the term, term smart cities uh, and have tried to modify it by referring to wise cities, uh, intelligent cities, responsive cities, uh, or open smart cities to try and indicate that there are other values that are important within the, the context of um, smart cities. Um, the another thing to note is that the term smart city is used in a broad range of contexts um, and that can muddy the water somewhat when you're talking about or trying to talk about smart cities um, so for example there are uh, so-called smart cities that are totally conceived from the ground up these are relatively rare um, but a common example is uh, the songdo uh, songdo uh, business district development in south korea sidewalk toronto's project for the waterfront in Toronto is also put forward as an example of this. Um, but it's important to note that these are often not cities as such, um, but instead they're specific developments of specific parcels of land or specific districts. In other words, they tend to be more like technology test beds rather than um, you know, fully fledged uh, cities. And so they present a very different context. And I think they're um, uh, success rate and the challenges that they raise are, are quite different. Um, there are also cities that adopt an integrated approach to using data and technology for their operations and to address urban challenges. Um, in Canada, Montreal and Edmonton are examples of this. In the US, um, New York, San Francisco, Boston uh, are all examples and there are many others. Um, in Europe, Barcelona I think is the most commonly used example um, and it it's unique in a number of respects, particularly with its kind of citizen-focused uh, approach to um, smart cities. Um, and so that's another category of smart cities, and some do it better than others and in a, on a more integrated basis than others. Um, there are also cities that take a scattergun approach to technology. That's fairly common, adopting a piece of technology here and a piece of technology there. Um, they might try to look smart, um, but they don't tend to fit within the definition of smart cities, in part because this is not an integrated um, uh, interoperable approach to the collection and use of data. It tends to be one department deciding it's going to use this and another department deciding it's going to use that. Um, and so there's a, an incremental and ad hoc adoption. And the term smart city typically means something that is more uh, organized um, and systemic. Another thing to consider in the definition of smart city is not just the smart, but the city part of the term. Um, and many argue that a successful smart city should involve engaged citizens, broad consultation, the identification of problems and challenges by the city and not by tech platforms or tech companies um, with privacy and human rights at the forefront. Um, in in the, the smart city, which emphasizes the city, there should be uh, also uh, perhaps an avoidance of technology for technology's sake, um, as well as thoughtful processes for evaluating the quality uh, of the technology, its usefulness in addressing the urban challenges that are considered to be most important by the populace, um, potential for adverse impacts, and so on. So switching gears a bit, I want to talk um, briefly about the thing which all smart cities um, are geared to collect and process, which is data. Um, the massive quantities of fine-grained data about everything from infrastructure and environmental conditions to data about individuals, whether it's de-identified or personal data, all raise important questions about ownership and control over data. Um, traditionally, cities have co collected data about their operations, um, public sector data protection and access to information laws, um, have applied regarding privacy, access, and transparency issues. Um, cities uh, can also make non-personal data available as open data, and many of them do this. Um, and, and in this context, the, the, we have a, 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 a accountability and transparency and privacy framework that puts the city at the center. Um, but because smart cities typically involve many public-private partnerships, um, and in many cases, um, it may be the private sector company that is the so-called owner, and I always use that term in, in air quotes, uh, of the data, um, 
uh, and in contexts where increasingly art intelligence and machine learning become more important, um, it can also be the private sector that owns the intellectual property rights in the technologies and claims rights over the data. And this raises important questions about transparency. Um, what is confidential commercial information or commercially sensitive information? Are algorithms protected trade secrets? Um, so you shift from a model where the transparency issues are determined by public sector um, legislation and now it's, it's a question of private sector ownership and control. Uh, it raises questions about access um, beyond transparency. Will the city's digital data be capable of being shared with others, including local developers, either as open data or under other data sharing frameworks? About privacy, what personal data is being collected by private sector companies? How is it sent to this collection or to downstream uses? What rights and control do they have? Uh, what about collective privacy concerns or broader human rights concerns about how the uses of the data might exclude some and target? Um, it also raises questions about sovereignty. Are cities guaranteed access to their urban data in case of the bankruptcy of the private sector partner? Uh, do city officials have appropriate access to data for law enforcement or security purposes? Um, the, and these issues are also linked to localization questions. Should a city's vital data uh, as well as the personal data of its residents be required to be stored locally in the country where the city is located. Um, there are also issues as we use more and more artificial intelligence uh, technologies about algorithmic fairness, algorithmic transparency, and algorithmic accountability. Um, and, and it's necessary to think about the principles that should guide the adoption of um, automated decision making by cities. Uh, the levels of transparency and accountability that will be available and the recourse that citizens will have. So that's just my brief, and maybe it was a bit longer than I intended, uh, overview of, of some of those uh, issues, and I'm going to pass it over to Bianca now. Bianca? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa, and I want to echo uh, the thank you to both Susan and Thomas uh, for getting us up and getting us organized today. I'm going to take a few minutes here to talk about some of the issues around smart cities in terms of do they do what they're supposed to I think is is a really big question um, there's a lot of discussion about the governance of data and how we want to manage that the tools that might be part of a smart city like the software and the hardware um, before I do that, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about those exact words, software and hardware. Um, I just want to sort of break down the term for us and all back, and talk about the smart part and the city part. And I'm going to talk about the city part first because I think one thing um, many people here may talk or think about data policy, trade policy, um, things at a national level, and a lot of the legislation and the policy making. Um, that's done around data governance and you know, economic development, um, a lot of it is thought about at the national level. But cities, which is clearly where the smart city technologies and data governance issues land, um, are really the ones that are, that, are, that are dealing with some really complicated and complex issues right now. And they don't have the same resourcing from a legal perspective, from a financial perspective, than national governments or even regional or provincial or state governments. So I think there's an interesting piece to remember here that we're talking about cities and city governments being tasked with something that quite frankly, national and international policy tables are also considering. And I think that's, that's an important piece just to hold on to, and we'll come back to that. But we have to really think about this from an urban and from a city lens and, and what that means. Um, in terms of the smart part, I think there's a few points that need to be made off the bat. One of them is cities have been using technology to support their operations for decades. So there's sometimes this idea that it's now, you know, smart cities, lots of data, big data, what do we do? Um, cities have been using these things for a long time already. So I think that's one thing to just really note. And I think what we're dealing with right now with a lot of the issues that Teresa raised is a question of agency and how much should a city be doing without its residents sort of coming along into that decision-making process. And so I think what we're dealing with in this moment is a realization that there's a lot of, you know, I'd say as a society, there's a lot going on that a lot of us don't really have our heads around properly. I think consent and Susan mentioned the other day, you know, with apps, um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, but you got a notification. I would love to know how many people know what that notification means. I don't think very many people who are using Twitter and just got an update 
on the terms of use basically know what it said, but they're still using Twitter. And so this is one of these things that's happening over years is we're all using a lot of things. We don't really have a context or an understanding of, of what, what, it, what it means for us in reality. So I think at the city level, we have this moment where have been using sensors, they've been using software, they've been collecting a lot of data for a while already. And now we're starting to say, hold on a second, really looking at that system as a whole properly. Because I think as Teresa mentioned, there's a lot of scattershot application. I'm going to use some very specific examples here. Cities use technology and software and hardware to do things like um, if, you're, if you're signing your kids up for a camp and you make an application to see if they can get into a city program, that is the city using software and data to deliver a service to you. That's one example. Um, I don't know how many of you have the, the app in your or the website capability to see where the snow plows are. Uh, so you can look up uh, where in the city the, the, the streets have been plowed. So that's good. And there's tracking going on to be able to know that. But then you also start to say, hey, there's a surveillance angle, which is, hey, we know where everybody who drives those snowplows, you know, happen to be at this very moment. Um, is that a consequence we've talked about for the people driving those, those snowplows? Um, so these are just, I just want to throw out a few examples so that we get away from this as a, you know, inaccessible word and start to think about where this stuff is already being used. Um, there may be opportunities to use sensors to collect information on air quality, right? That's happening now. That's very different than data about people in a city. So these are just a few examples that you, when you say hardware and software, you know, sensors that collect data, that's, that's a piece of hardware, that's some of our infrastructure. Um, software, you know, using applications to deliver services. So long story short, a lot of this is already happening. So let's move into the, the, the question, which is really, is it working? And I think, there's a few things, and as Teresa mentioned, there's, there's a lot of good critique on this. I love to recommend a piece called The City is, you know, City is Not a Computer. Um, it's by Shannon Mattern, and it really, I think, really brings us into focus, which is to say, you can collect all kinds of data about all kinds of different pieces of the city, but cities are so inherently complex that I think it's very difficult to pinpoint if these systems are actually to create an understanding of causation between systems to say, okay, we've engineered the perfect mix of stoplights turning red and, you know, reducing X over here and speeding up, you know, Y over there. The idea that we can actually control the environment to that degree, from my perspective, is not really proven well. And so there's a lot of solutionism in space, which is to say, we can collect a lot of data, we can give you a lot of fancy charts, we can give you a lot of reports, but is it really being done with an end to say that it's, it's really improving things on the whole? It's not there. And I think this is what gets dangerous in this final kind of type of smart city that is, is happening now. Um, you actually have private incentives to structure the way that cities operate so that, that there's, there's, a, there's an inherently um, designed business model in there. And I think it's really important to say like cities are not a product. And the problem with a lot of this, this thinking around smart cities, privacy is a major issue, absolutely. But there's a very, very large component here where we need to think, are we designing the privatization of our governance into these products? And are cities aware that they're potentially procuring systems that we are all now gonna have to maintain for years to come? So are they even working? And secondly, are we aware that we're handing over control and power to actors who may be very well intentioned, but may actually be creating an enclosure where they become a necessary element of city operations? And that's happening right now. And so I think that's a very important piece of this discussion is how do we maintain control in, if, in a democratic sense of how our cities operate? And that means that we need to increase, and this is where we go back to understanding and engagement, we need to increase resident capacity and public sector capacity to be defining how these things work, not to be purchasing them, because there's a really big difference between those two things. And so I can stop there. I think there's a lot of points we can pull out from our conversation, but just want to sort of pull, really make sure that we do that, that we pull it out and that we make a good safe space for everybody who might not have an urbanism background or really think about these issues from a city perspective, please don't be fearful of asking a question that has anything to do with cities um, because we're really happy to think about your questions in that context. But I'll stop there. Thank you so much. What is 
so disturbing about both of your presentations is this is another example of where technology is so way ahead of governance. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, in a time where we desperately need data to solve problems, we haven't set up the rules for governing such data. Um, with that in mind, I just want to make one brief announcement, which is thank you again to everybody who's joined us. Please feel free to ask any question. There's no question that's stupid. Mm -hmm. And if you missed any of this, it will be on our YouTube channel at datagovhub.org. And so we have some questions to begin with, but again, please, um, please give us your questions. So the first question is to what degree can smart sites, cities, sorry, be transparent equalizers with regards to addressing and meeting the needs of underserved residents? Would anyone like, can anyone answer that question? Do you want to go first, Bianca? Or? Yeah, certainly. I think um, that I'll start with, with a sort of high level pronouncement around technology tends to accelerate pre-existing power dynamics. So if the question is, can smart cities or would, would you know, more technology generally be something that could equalize or lift up marginalized residents? The answer there would be no. What would likely happen is it would further divide um, whatever the cause of that marginalization might be. I think this is where we need to talk about the surveillance element of, um, of technology. Um, I say this because I'm talking about history. I would love to be able to say that we could use a lot of data collection and a lot of technologies to better serve marginalized residents. That's definitely an option. And if governments want to show up and do that, um, the tech sector would have a lot of ways to support if they were given clear definitions around you know, how to do that. But the history of this is that that's not how technology is used. Technology is generally used to surveil. And, if, um, and, and this is the big problem with surveillance technologies is police, punished, track. Um, I think this is where I would reference Virginia Eubanks' work. The more data collected about you, the more opportunity there is to potentially you know, do sort of means testing. And uh, there's just a lot of negative history around that question. So I would like to be hopeful and say yes. And I'm going to let Teresa see if she's got some places where she'll maybe say yes and, and maybe not. Um, but I do think it's really important not to um, not to take the framing as something that as an ahistorical, because historically, the answer to that question is, is no, it does not. Yeah, and I would I would tend to agree. I think Bianca's made some excellent points there. I, um, I think we can also see the extent to which um, cities have uh, or many cities have uh, embraced technologies of surveillance um, and control and monitoring as part of smart cities uh, initiatives. And we've seen a lot of, for example, a lot of interest in predictive policing and a lot of interest in uh, adoption of, of uh, smart technologies by police services. There was all of this discussion around Clearview AI. And again, it's, that's not a smart city technology. And I think it's a really interesting example of um, a technology that, um, that creeps into use without proper accountability, surveillance, or even knowledge um, that it's been adopted. Um, so it, it doesn't, it, it fits more the scattershot version of smart cities rather than the organized, uh, thoughtful, more thoughtful version of smart cities. But, um, but, but there's, um, and, and even in our uh, current uh, COVID-19 situation, there's a lot of talk about um, adoption, use of data for surveillance type um, uh, surveillance and monitoring um, and so on. So I think, I think that's a, that's a real concern. Um, the concern about the, I, I think there's also a concern about the experimentation with automated decision making, for example, on the most vulnerable populations, the pop, perhaps the populations also least likely to be able to organize um, themselves to object. Um, and so you have the, you know, the adoption of um, automated decision making for, for social housing or benefits. Um, uh, automated decision making is used with respect to inmates uh, in Canada. It's been adopted in the uh, immigration and refugee system. So, you know, there is a tendency to, to target those populations as the populations on which we will experiment with some of these technologies. And, and I think that that's something that we need to be very attentive to. It's not to say that smart that a smart cities program couldn't um, 
think about technologies that would be useful uh, or, or identify problems that might be assisted by technology. And there are a lot of civil society groups, for example, that have used data in creative and interesting ways to address issues. Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, to, to try and uh, coordinate data about spaces and homeless shelters. Uh, where that data is not integrated or coordinated so, so that there's a better understanding of where there might be places in homeless shelters. There are, there are ways in which you could, you could identify specific problems and find solutions to that using data. But that's where the, the, the kind of um, the ground up approach to identifying what the problems are and what the solution could be and how it could be implemented in a way that's thoughtful and respectful of uh, of privacy um, and other human rights considerations becomes important. And probably you're not going to get tech giants um, offering these kinds of technology services to cities and saying, here, we've got this great, you know, uh, system for figuring out where you have um, space in shelters for the homeless, because they're going to be interested in something that, that is, um, that's got more bells and whistles and that's, um, that's oriented to, to, to some other um, area that that is of, of greater interest to them. So you know, it's, it's not that technology can't be used to address um, issues that affect um, all sectors and segments of society and can't be used effectively. It's just that it often isn't, and it's often used in ways that are actually um, punitive and repressive. And I think those are things that we have to be really attentive to. And very quickly, because I know there's a lot of questions coming in, I just want to say two, two things. One, let's get right back to hardware, infrastructure, and, and access. Not everybody has the internet. And so I think that right there, like, let's worry about that first, because that is a big piece of this. If we're making great services at the government level, but people don't have access to the internet, then who are we serving? And that's an example of saying it just entrenches existing sort of power dynamics so let's see government investments in those infrastructures and then yeah that would be a great step toward you know some sort of more proportional power relationship um, but that's something the government hasn't done just as an example right like that's a critical infrastructure and i think we're seeing it in this moment so there's such a stark you know exposure of that lack of infrastructure you've got people driving up to school parking lots to access the wi-fi and that's how their kids are supposed to be doing their homework so that's one. So big opportunity there, which is hardware and infrastructural, not surveillant. Um, and the second piece, just to say that if, um, if, if, that, if that infrastructure layer is there, I'm learning through some of my colleagues to get off of this state corporate thing and, and add the third piece, which um, Teresa sort of was gesturing at, which is communities and people designing their own technologies and setting up governance mechanisms that enable us to you know, build what we want and to manage what we want and to have some more sort of um, control and direction there. So I think I, I just to end it on a note of like, there are, yes, there are opportunities. Those are two ways to maybe think about this in a, in a different framing that, um, that does start to shift power, which is what we should be getting at because there's so much you can do with technology that you don't wanna just say, okay, no, you know, no, because too dangerous, maybe it depends, we have to look at who the actors are and who has the power, right? Thank you for that answer, ladies. Our next question asks about the Bayh-Dole Act implications. The Bayh-Dole Act is U.S. legislation, and since our speakers are Canadian, and I um, am not comfortable answering this question, or um, given my lack of expertise on this, I hope you'll forgive us for skipping that one. I'm going to be typing the answers and showing you the questions from, from now on. Uh, but you'll only be able to see them after I type it in. So our next question is, are there good examples of smart cities that have engaged citizens in design participatory governance mechanisms? Can anyone answer that one? Teresa, do you want to expand on a few of the ones you mentioned before? I've got an answer, but it, you want to go first? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll mention a couple. I mean, Barcelona is always, uh, I, I think, held up as the, the poster child for this, as a city that has tried to um, engage citizens in the identification of, um, of, of problems that need to be resolved and engage citizens in um, thinking about solutions, um, in exploring novel ways of managing citizen personal information within the urban context. Um, and so, 
so I think, you know, Barcelona is really um, the one that gets talked about most often. Um, closer to home, I think Montreal is an interesting example. And, and Montreal has been uh, trying to do a lot of, really, I think, thoughtful things with uh, smart city technology in terms of uh, encouraging citizen engagement and thinking very carefully about um, privacy, civil liberties, human rights um, in uh, the adoption of technologies. Um, and so it really, uh, I think those, uh, those are a couple of cities that I'd mentioned as examples, but I also want to underline the fact that, uh, and, and this is interesting in the city context too, that so much depends on people um, and, the, and the people who are involved and, and their particular vision. Um, and so, um, uh, so I, you know, I, I, do, I think that's tremendously important. It also makes it tremendously fragile. Right, that you can put these things in place um, and have consultative processes, and you can have this kind of very um, open, democratic, smart city as you uh, implement or as you put the sensors in place and so on. I don't want to be too dark about this, but um, but you could be laying down a lot of infrastructure that could become uh, surveillance after the fact and uh, and so as long as you have good and thoughtful people who are creating this participatory engaged smart city that's what you have um, but I think you have to that's something that you have to to, to maintain that you have to protect with appropriate um, uh, laws or policies um, uh, and uh, perhaps legal infrastructure as well to safeguard it, because I think these things can be very vulnerable to shifts in political climate and um, uh, shifts in approach to, to smart cities. Those kinds of things take, well, it's like democracy. It actually takes a lot of work to maintain. Okay, I, Bianca, I'm going to, there's a question directly for you. Because we have so many questions, I'm just, to this one for you. Can cloud computers needed for smart cities be dominant by two or three companies as we see today, or will we see competition? It's a great question. I mean, I, I'm, I, I never do predictive stuff on what's going to happen. The, 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 the degree of power centralization right now, it looks like the ones that are dominant now um, will, they have a pretty, they have a good, <laughs> pretty good reason to believe that they're entrenched enough that that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, but what I think is really important to talk about with the cloud stuff is that, and it, it's, it, it's why we have to shift how we think about um, democratic participation in some areas is that what's different about digital infrastructure versus hard infrastructure is that we can, we can create changes in it, even while it's latent and purchased already is that you can change standards that dictate how software operates. Um, so you can actually force some of the things that are there to act differently if you, if, you, if you set rules. And standards is one way to do that. And so I think sometimes we need to rethink um, which, part of, which part of a technology solution we're trying to exert control on or where we have leverage as people, you know, trying to participate in this, in this world. So I think what we need to start to think about is you know, much like hard infrastructures, the, and I think telecoms, we have a lot of lessons to learn from telecoms, but to say, okay, that's there, that's owned. Let's think about the rules that dictate how that stuff works and think about how we return power to people that aren't just also defining just the technology. We need to think about the governance layer. So I think there's a highly, you know, I think it's highly likely a lot of what it is today is going to stay there. There's a good reason. It's hard to, but we need to think about how that changes. But I really think shifting focus into governance and how to manage what's there um, is a near term, um, is, it's important in the near term. Um, that's, that. I'll, I'll stop there. Our next questioner asks, how are smart cities different from other private sector attempts to help cities in the past? There's a lot. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And I think it's so important not to get caught up in this exceptionalism where it's like, wow, we don't know anything because smart cities data technology, woo, which is part of the problem with this. Um, so some of it is the same. And I think it's interesting to look at cases where the industry started to push adoption of things that maybe, you know, weren't coming as much from the city. Because I'll give you an example. One of the things that is challenging, and I think something we really need to get a better handle on, is when private sector companies are starting to try to define how we use public infrastructures and public assets. 
rules around how roads are used, how curves are used, how parking is defined. Once you put a whole bunch of sensors and data collection over top of previously public infrastructures, you have another actor dictating rules by the sort of products that they offer. And I think there are historical examples. You can talk about building materials. You can talk about a lot of things where I think there is, there is historical um, precedent. So we need to understand where was that fine and where was that a problem? Where did that create dependencies? How did we get sort of, um, I just regulatory capture is probably the best way to think about some of this stuff where when you build in, so you know, when you build sort of codified rules around how cities are working into your product, you're locking out public engagement in, in those rules. And so I think, great point, we have examples of this before, but we really need to think about what's different here is that there's a privatization of systems that's going on that is not legible enough. We are not talking enough about what is happening because we're mistaking buying something like a pen or a book um, for something that is not that, which is a system. We're actually procuring systems that, that, that influence our governance. So that to me is this very, very big difference with the smart city, which is both super problematic because we're not naming it. And I think I'm gonna say, Teresa knows this well, the discourse around privacy has blitzed the conversation around the fact that the rules around how our cities work are being privatized because it's through software. And I think I'll end on this point, part of what makes these conversations so hard is that you can't see software, it's abstract. There's something going on here that we can't see. It's much like why people don't understand what happens between their keyboard and, and the data that's collected about them and how it's used. You can't see it anywhere. So we all need to do a better job of making this issue more legible so we can start to get more engaged with it. That is a defining difference between what's happened with this before and where we're going now with it. Thank you. Yeah. I, okay, our next question is for Professor Skasa. I'm trying to- Sorry. We have so many questions. I'm being bitchy. Please forgive me, everybody on the planet who's here. But um, this way we can answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, so this is for you, Teresa. Is it possible to build democratic smart cities? Uh, I, well, it's, it should be possible. Uh, some of the challenges that that Bianca just identified are really important ones. I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of pressure for cities to adopt particular platform or platform-based solutions um, with the advantages of interoperability between the different features and so on of the platform. Um, but once you start doing that, you do start having technology dictate your systems. And so I think this is part of the the answer that that. Uh, that Bianca just gave that you you risk having um, technology in subtle and not so subtle ways um, uh, take over some of the decision making function and and doing it on a longer term because you get locked in and you are you know you you have relatively little power in terms of what happens I mean and and your platform may develop these upgrades that require you to change or do things differently and you really don't have a lot of choice but to continue to upgrade and to continue to pay for those upgrades. So, and I think that there's, there's, um, there are real risks in terms of vendor lock-in. Now, um, there may be other, uh, and there are other approaches to, to using smart cities and using technology. And I know Bianca has written and thought, um, thought and written about um, the, um, the need to develop more capacity within municipalities, for example, to actually deal with technology to develop technology to um you know to work within not just municipal but um other levels of government as well um to uh, to maybe think of uh using more um uh in-house skill and ability uh, to development it goes against the whole this whole kind of neoliberal argument that we need to outsource everything and let the private sector do all of this for us but maybe we need to start thinking about doing a lot more of it uh, internally looking at open source um, solutions, um, thinking very carefully about what our particular municipal problems are and what are our particular municipal priorities in terms of um, technological solutions uh, and doing more of that development in-house or with um, local developers. And so, you know, those are ways in which we, you know, or options, 
alternatives that I think are important to think about. It's like, how do we go about doing it? Do we just go to the convenient platform? And believe me, these things are being marketed to cities. And, you know, there are back in the day when we could go to conferences and all this sort of thing, you know, there are conferences for people to go to and they get treated to lovely dinners and they get to see all of these technology demonstrations and exciting things and they kind of bring them back and, you know, let's purchase this because we know about it and, and we saw this glossy presentation and this seems to be like the perfect thing but there are actually other solutions and other ways to develop and use technology uh, so I think you have to be attentive to uh, to those as well thank you okay our next question is um, what what should be done at the federal level and what should be done at the local level related to smart cities that's a very broad question but um, she cites his example the European debate about the use of facial recognition yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there, you know, there are some things that um, that I think are best done at the the federal or the state level, um, and so I would think things like um, things like data protection, uh, for example, setting like actual. Well, I, mean, I guess that's complicated because it depends on what kind of federal system you're in and, and so on. Uh, that's a whole other discussion. But, uh, but having um, strong, uh, consistent national standards around data protection can be uh, extremely uh, beneficial. Uh, and so, for example, it's challenging for a city that wants to make certain things in terms of uh, technological standards for uh, privacy or data protection um, if, if those are different from, you know, what is what exists on a national scale. Because then that city will be told, well, you're asking us to do a custom version of this for you because you have something that's different from these others and we want to go with them. You know, in Canada, we do experience this low, lowest common denominator phenomenon. Um, uh, we, we sit in the middle between, uh, sort of on a national scale, we sit in the middle between the GDPR on the one hand um, and the free-for-all uh, with data in the United States on the other and we have our own kind of um, uh, well-meaning but um, feebly enforced um, privacy legislation. and and. You know, and it's it's hard if you don't have those high consistent standards to um, to leverage uh, the force of those to uh, require tech providers to comply with those standards. And so, I think where you want to have high consistent standards, whether it's around automated decision making or uh, data protection and so on, it's better to have those at a higher level, whether that's the the national level if the constitution permits it or the, the state level um, as an alternative uh, rather than at the individual municipal level. And so I think those are, those are places where it can be very effective to have strong national laws. Bianca wants to jump in. Just super quick, because there are two points. One of them, the elephant in the room with cities, which is that both cities and nations want to be innovation nations or cities that have an economic development imperative. And this gets really mixed up with smart cities because cities, even the progressive, the, the sort of poster children of good smart city stuff, um, are basically saying, we're gonna have a lot of data flying around here because if we do that, and this is, I think, quite patently false, um, we will then have the opportunity to build all kinds of tech from it, and then we're gonna have some kind of a economic development story happen. So there's this real pressure to just, because if data is the input to things that a lot of countries are trying to lead on, artificial intelligence, so, you're not going to shut off the source of the input of the thing that you want to have an economic policy that's, you know, driven by, right? So there's, you've got a snake eating its tail problem there. So you just don't want to leave that alone in this discussion. I think always is that cities and nations are both trying to be data tech friendly, like that's its own whole narrative. And there's a lot of pressure there, which, which just says, just have a lot of data flying around because it's an input to the economy. Let's just park that. But the second thing, just as a protection at the city level, or maybe a good thing to think about of guidance for cities in the way that Teresa was describing, defining their policies, um, is hyper-local smart cities. And there's a woman named Alia Bacha who wrote a really nice piece about this in Toronto, because different neighborhoods will have different desires. And I think in those cases, how do you leave the flexibility to, 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 allow, to allow a neighborhood level sort of control around 
data collection use and the rest of it. And I think that might be a nice requirement to consider when anybody at a city or, or state or national level um, is thinking about writing sort of requirements for, for how their technology operates. So I think we even need to break it down one level smaller because the city, like Toronto is a city of two cities. It's not all the same. Residents don't have the same experience in that city. And so it's gonna default to that first point. It's gonna go to the power. It's gonna go to the wealthy people who live in the city, their sort of um, concerns around how you would use data and technology will be the overarching ones that get fed into policy that's not the right way to do it. So we, I, I really think we have to think about how we protect the most hyper-local unit of what a smart city sort of thing might look like, which is the neighborhood. So let's just add that into the conversation as we think about it. I think that's, that's a good piece. They're all components, but let's even think about the neighborhood. Okay. I, I'm going to ask that you guys try to keep your questions short because we have 20 seconds to some more questions. Um, uh, so we've just been asked, um, can you think of, uh, there were, were there any referendums for smart cities? I don't know of any off the top of my head, Bianca, do you know? Neither do I, so that's a quick answer, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we don't. Okay. Um, in terms of surveillance, um, we've been in this, um, has COVID-19 has brought this issue into, um, into smart focus. Um, can you give a good example of safeguards against law enforcement and national security justifications for getting at personal data through smart cities? Give a good yeah. example of like how to, how just to say it again. do it right. Yeah, don't collect the data. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, that's my answer. I'll stop there. Don't collect the data because data is being used out of the context upon which it was collected. And that will be the fundamental conversation we need to keep having over and over again. So can you I, can be well can, can you yeah. reframe that? Are you saying don't use the data or don't use the data? Do you have rules governing both various types of data and, and for how and when it can be used? Is that what you mean? What I'm saying is if you want to be safe, you don't collect it in the first place because there's no such thing. I mean, you, you, with, with how dangerous some of this is getting for people and their existence, emergency power is coming into effect. There is no historical basis to say that you're going to ratchet down what's potentially happening right now. And so I just, my, my thing right here is all of this data gets used out of context. You're not thinking about the future. So my answer is there isn't such a thing right now and we should be heavily bent toward minimizing what's collected in the first place and potentially making certain collection um, off the table or illegal or whatever you want to call it. I think that's my answer is there isn't that right now. Yeah, and if I can just jump in there, I think, I think we've had for, you know, historically we've had, a, 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 had constitutional systems that limit the, the power of uh, police and national security authorities to track individuals and to, uh, to track, to monitor, surveil uh, their constitutional protections. There are warrant systems and uh, the need to, for judicial oversight and surveillance. At the same time, we have the private sector collecting massive quantities and incredibly fine-grained data about us that not only track us, but uh, collect our faces from facial recognition technologies that collect biometric data that uh, uh, including genetic and DNA data uh, that that collect uh, all of this data about us, voice prints, uh, discussions from personal data assistance, all of this sort of stuff. Um, and it sits there and when crises happen or there's some sort of exigency, we find that the that this whole system of warrants and, and judicial surveillance and oversight that we've created for the old times is not working well as a protection or a barrier um, uh, or a moderating uh, or playing a moderating function when it comes to gaining access to this massive lake of detailed data. And I think, and I've been saying this for years now, that we have to be really attentive to that, uh, that barrier that exists or that is supposed to exist between um, the state and this enormous collection of data. And I think when people say, oh, well, you know, privacy policies, or I am not doing anything wrong, I don't care, or privacy is dead, I think they're forgetting that it's not just about our relationship with Twitter or our relationship with, with Facebook, such as it is, but it's about this very thin barrier between the surveillance state and all of that data. Um, and I think we have to be really, really concerned about that. We don't have legal and constitutional infrastructure that is adapted to our uh, current times. Wow, that's very upsetting. <laughs> no, 
Uh-huh. It's a happy, happy conversation. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get to the next question. Um, can you talk about data trust and who should be on the board for governing data trust? And is that a good answer for smart cities? So I'm going to keep this very short. Please look up Sean McDonald, and he's writing. You know, he's done a lot of writing on data trust, and um, I think the I'll, I'll say two very quick things based on time. One is the the conversation has shifted to the tool, which is the data trust, instead of the problem. The great thing about data trust is that they are a mechanism to share governance and to think about our capacity to do a different power sharing arrangement, and so just the second part of the question is let's not worry about the data trust part of it we need to look at what it encourages as a new governance model because we know what we have right now is not working so we need to bring a different sort of table setting and so who should be on there is anybody that has a relationship to the consequence of data use and that's what is beautiful about this potential model is you can bring different actors around a table and shift how just shift us out of what is right now a very like state or corporate governance sort of thinking and into something where there can be more collective power, collective agency. That's the upside there. And that's how we need to think about who's around the table. But let's not get stuck on, on the tool. Let's think about the governance piece. That's it. And that that and then just as a follow-up, please read some stuff from Sean McDonald on that. He's written a lot. Our, and you can find that on the CG website. Yeah. Uh, do smart cities conform to the definition of public-private partnerships? Yeah. I'll just quickly say, People would like us to think that they conform to our pre-existing thinking about public-private partnerships. Um, and the piece of it that they will not say, I would say explicitly, is that you privatize the profit and you socialize the risk, <laughs> which is why P3s, from a critical perspective, I can't believe we're still on them half the time. Because who pays? The public. If it works, who gets the benefits? The private sector. And, and yes, we get some access to infrastructures, but at what cost? So I would say that piece seems to be the same, but the part of it that is not the same is that a lot of our P3s are this, we think about hospitals, bridges, infrastructures that we are just talking about financing. We're not losing control. Just what's different here is that we're privatizing governance with the P3, which is not what we do when we're just doing a financialization of a hard asset. So that again, is just that same answer. Thank you for that. Okay. How is COVID-19 influencing the debate over smart cities in Canada? Um, if I jump in there, I, I mean, I think one of the things that I found really interesting um, in, uh, in sort of monitoring what's happening around data and COVID-19, um, or some of the things that are interesting, one is this um, uh, enthusiasm for solving COVID-19 and its related problems using data. And, and so while there, there's, I think, lots of interesting work and good work that could be done with various types of data around COVID-19 um, and, and the search for uh, COVID-19 data solutions, at the same time, I found it really interesting that in terms of a lot of the um, uh, tracking, contact tracing, other types of uh, uh, solutions around social distancing, for example, uh, and quarantine, um, there's, I think, a tendency, uh, a fairly knee-jerk tendency to say, just do whatever and get it done and, and then it'll be better. And there's not been sufficient critical thinking about um, the quality of available data, the nature of available data, how useful these apps will be, the extent to which that they fit within our, um, uh, our, uh, our, our own frameworks for, um, for privacy. And, in many cases, it actually doesn't take a lot of reflection to do things in a more privacy, uh, a more privacy-friendly way. Um, so, for example, there was a regulation that was passed a couple of days ago in Ontario that basically just said um, uh, the, the, it was an emergency regulation that said firefighters, police officers, paramedics, first responders, essentially, can call up and ask if a person is. Uh, has tested positive for COVID-19. And obviously the intent is to protect first responders if they're going to a particular uh, incident or site or whatever to, um, to know the, the risk that they're exposing to themselves if somebody is COVID-19 positive. But the regulation has no privacy protection in it whatsoever. There's no limitation of purpose to say that they can get this information for the purposes of responding to or for these particular purposes. There's no uh, 
tracking or monitoring um, that's required in order to see who has access, who's requested access at what time so that you can have an accountability framework or you can have transparency about the requests that are being made. There's, there's no privacy safeguard. So what I'm saying is there's this, this kind of rush to data solutions, rush to providing data, rush to do all of these sorts of things without even taking the time to think about what we already know about privacy, transparency, accountability, and building those uh, into it. And so to me, this is, a, this is a real concern in this response. I think it's shown a lack of um, critical thinking about data quality and data usefulness, a lack of um, willingness to, uh, to, to, to think about the privacy and security. Uh, that needs to be part of this discussion. Um, and at the same time, you know, there are admittedly lots of good things we could do with the data. I just think we have to put those pieces together more effectively. Okay. Um, this is a lightning round now. This is the lightning round. All the answers are going to be super well, fast. Here we go. Can you um, maybe stay for five more minutes? Absolutely. That's what sure. I'm saying. We're going into lightning round now. All answers are going to be really short from us. Okay. Um, how do you overcome the problem of smart cities uh, lack of involvement of, of average citizens? We have to give political leaders permission to slow down right now so that we can go fast once we've talked to each other and understand what we're doing. So we need to have political support for like, like for, for the leadership and for policy to say, hold on, we need to get this right together, which will take a bit of time. And then we can do all this stuff. But if you don't get it right now, you're actually gonna, you're gonna blow the whole opportunity. So we have to figure out how we come together to cover so we can have those things because politicians are under pressure to just do the, do the new innovation, blah, 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 blah. Um, and they need to confidently assert that, no, we need to slow down and do this properly. So we need to help make that happen. How can um, technology, uh how can governance catch up to technology? I think it's a capacity question. So I just think what we've done over the last 20, 30 years is really hollowed out the public sector capacity to, to, to guide and direct how our technologies work for the public. So I think we need to reinvest in those things in the state big time. How can colleges and universities make use of smart city innovations while still maintaining data governance? Um, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, or if it's a question about um, uh, ethical research data use or access to the smart city data and ethical use, but it, it may be that that's the, uh, that that's the, the response by, by working within frameworks for, uh, for the, the ethical research data frameworks that universities have. How do you get nonprofits at the table for smart cities? Give them money so they can uh, they can afford to be there. Yeah. Who should give them money though? If the, you, gov if, the government. If Google the gov gives them money. The government. The government. The state. The state. See, that's a very Canadian answer, right? <laughs> I think. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so, it's, so, so let's lead with it. I think others can pick up on that. We okay. don't need to privatize this anymore. All right. There's a chill on all of this stuff. Someone, someone tells you to go, yeah, we'll fund you to go to the table and then you better watch what you say. Oh no, it had nothing to do with what you said, but no, you have no more money anymore. Like that, that's what happens. We're all pretending that doesn't happen. It happens. So it has to be publicly funded. The same can happen with public funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I agree with you, but there's a, it's, it's a lower likelihood to have that problem there. Okay, thank you. Who owns the smart cities data? Teresa, can you expand on that? You, you mentioned that a little bit earlier. Yeah, I, I can give you the, the um, typical lawyer answer, which is it depends. <laughs> but um, yeah, and it does. But, um, but I think that's an important question for cities. And like ownership is a term I think that, that I always put in air quotes because it's, a, it's very fraught when it comes to data. And I think it's probably better to think of who has kind of custody and control over data or what are the different interests that are present in data. And so it may be that with certain smart city data, there's multiple interests. It may be that the private sector company that has collected the data has a certain interest in that data. The city has a certain interest and, and individuals who are the data who are who may be data subjects might have an interest as well in that data there may be a broader community interest so i think we have to think about who has interests in the data and what the nature of those interests are and then we also think about who has uh, 
need to think about who has overall sort of responsibility for that data, whether it's the public sector or the private sector. And that can be something that is a matter of negotiation um, in contracts or agreements. And I think it's something that's important for cities to be attentive to, that they retain as much as possible the custody and control over the data in which there may be multiple interests. It helped me a lot in my learning, which was we should be focusing on use, like getting a lot, you know, ownership is a piece we really need to think about, but think about the use of the data. What is it, you know, what are the uses and how do we govern the uses? Because I think that's a good way to sort of redirect attention because it's very helpful to think about use. Because I think ownership with this stuff is very challenging also from, there's an abstraction there. What, what do you think about when you think about data governance? Power. Uh, uh, control. So similar, very, sim very similar sort of answer, but but responsibility also, I would say, with data governance. That trade offs. That, sorry, trade offs. I think trade offs. No, trade offs is a big one because I think none of these things, like the responsibility to think about the trade offs, right? It's like, is if you have a marginal improvement because of this, what what is it costing you? And then suddenly, sometimes you turn around and go, you know what? This isn't worth it. Like we need to get better at having trade-offs discussions. I think that's why I think this is about power, because that's something that law is good at doing, right, Teresa? Like that's sort of yeah. with law and economics come together well around trade-offs discussions. Okay. Uh, can you provide any thoughts on the impact of bias in design and implementation of programs? Yeah, it's humans just showing their worst and bringing that right on into all the work. Like it's 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 it's, it's as technology is going to be a reflection of all the people who are making it and people who make it have all kinds of bias. So I just think we need to be aware of that always and shouldn't try to imagine that that's not the yeah, case. And, and that's what it also is. with respect to data, we should also think about the data. I mean, so many of these database technologies are, are, ba are, are going to be based upon the, the data that we have been collecting and that we have historically collected. And, and that data will reflect its own biases in terms of you know uh, what data collect has been collected about whom and why and so on so that so that that feeds in as well yeah we're not going to solve structural race racism with algorithms like i think with this is a good example of the smart city what we really need is investments in good public transit you're not going to solve it with software so same thing we have societal problems the problems about bias and about racism about structural inequity we need to solve them where they exist we can't solve them with tech we're not going to tech our way out of those things we're only going to make them worse with tech um, well, so now people are thinking a lot about unemployment as a result of COVID-19 and smart cities could lead to lots of unemployment. Are, are, can you think of a way to balance these needs to go smart without undermining job creation? Yeah, if, if we protect human agency and decent work, and we make those requirements for how tools are designed that, you know, can be used. I think we can, we, we, we need to go back to care and think about what humans excel at and where can we be caring for people? How do we, in our service, look at Canada, massive service economy, right? How do we protect and expand where the humans are helping and supporting and caring and protect and build out that profession and not try to automate it? So tons of opportunity to do it, but you need political will and intention. It's not going to happen right now. We've got that efficiency mindset that's trying to, to trying to flatten the human's role in work. And that's the wrong way. So we need to we need to lead there. But that's like it's our choice. We got a path. We can do that. OK, some of these questions are. Um you've already answered to some extent, so I'm gonna skip a little, please forgive me. How can governments ensure public interests are not threatened by tech companies' profit motives? They can, they, they can admit that they are right now. I mean, it's complete corporate capture of policy design. The way it works right now is corporations are trying to influence how technology policy is set and they resist it until they can co-author it. So that's what we're dealing with right now. So until we name that problem, we're not gonna be getting anywhere to solving it. But we can, but we have to admit that it's happening right now. We're in under complete regulatory capture, at least in Canada. Yeah, I agree. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, how, how do you, in cities that have established smart programs, how can you keep citizens totally apprised of the process. 
it's really hard. And I think this is where we have to draw a line. What does the city know it can do without consultation that it's within bounds of its agency and that it has consent? And where does it have to go out and talk to people? Because we can't have everybody knowing every single piece of every single element of, of the stack that a city's using, like it's not gonna happen. So I think we need to figure out what are the things that demand consultation and conversation and which of the pieces have been going on for a long time and are established and are known to be good. I think, I think we really need to get specific about where do we consult and where don't we consult? Because the public's not in charge of everything, right? Like there is a reason for expertise. We've got wonderful people working in governments who are very, very thoughtful. We need to make sure that they have the power to push back against what I think is a heavily productized thing, which is Grace's description of people, you know, showing up to IT departments with all the things that solve all the problems and IT suddenly becoming bigger than what transportation parks or public health, which is not the way we need to go into the future. Um, so we can do it, but that's how, I think we just have to have a, a, that kind of a conversation. Okay, we have 16 more questions and maybe we can answer those um, online. But I guess we need to end this webinar since we promised an hour. Um, do you want to make any last comments? What a wonderful engaged group. Thank you so much for, uh, for attending and for asking uh, so many great questions. Really, really appreciate it. We yeah. really appreciate your involvement. Bianca and Teresa, Bianca, any last comments? Just that this is so helpful. And I, I think I just wanna say that we need to keep talking about all of this. So it was so great to have a conversation and anybody who shows up right now and says, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing, whether it's at a city or a national international level, run for the door, because this is complicated. So let's just keep having these conversations. I'm really grateful for everyone I'm making space for us to do it. And thank you, Susan, fantastic job moderating. I know Teresa would say the same. Thank and uh, well, thanks again, Thomas. Thank so. you, guys. Um, if you have ideas in our audience, please just email us, we're eager to do these every week until we're let out of our homes and yeah. in the streets again. So please email us with any ideas and needs you have. Our next one is on um, data as a national security issue. And um, so hopefully you can join us next Thursday at 11 again. And thank you all so much for joining us. And this will be available shortly on the YouTube site. And I apologize that we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Everybody have a great day. And to use the cliche, I hope you stay safe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.